Lesson 5 That One Should Not Trust His Own Understanding In the book of Proverbs it is written, Where there is no guidance, they fall like leaves. Salvation exists in much counsel. Can you see here the power of the word, brothers? Can you see what the Holy Scripture is teaching us? It safeguards us so that we do not trust ourselves, so that we do not consider ourselves wise, so that we do not believe that we can guide ourselves. We need assistance. After God himself, we need our guides. No one is more wretched, no one more vulnerable than the person who has no one to direct his path to God. What does it say? Where there is no guidance, they fall like leaves. In the beginning, a leaf is always green, thriving, and pleasant. Then it gradually dries up and falls off and is disregarded and trodden upon. It is the same for a person who is guided by no one. In the beginning, he is very enthusiastic about fasting, keeping the vigil, keeping silence, obedience, and all other good things. Then the fire is gradually extinguished, and with no guide to nourish him and kindle his fervor, he shrivels up, and without realizing it, he becomes a tool of his enemies who do whatever they want with him. Concerning those who confess everything about themselves and always act with counsel, it says, Salvation exists in much counsel. When it says much counsel, it does not mean that someone should take counsel from anybody and everybody, but evidently that he should receive guidance on all subjects from someone in whom he has full confidence. He should confess all, ask counsel about everything, and not remain silent about some matters while discussing others. It is precisely for him that salvation exists in much However, if a person does not confess everything concerning himself, and especially if he has evil habits or a bad upbringing, the devil finds some willfulness and justification within him, and will cast him down through that. For... When the devil sees a person who does not want to sin, he is not so stupid as to suggest one of the obvious sins to him. He does not say, go and commit fornication or go and steal to him. He knows that we do not want that and he does not indulge in telling us something we do not want to hear. Instead, as I said, he finds our will or our justification and harms through that, while appearing to do good. It is for this reason that it says, An evil man does harm when he mixes it with justice. The evil one is the devil that harms us when he mixes his evil with justice, that is to say, with our own justification. He is then more powerful, more harmful, and more active. For when we hold on to our own will, and trust our own justifications, we think that we are doing good, whereas in fact we are working against ourselves, and cannot see that we are completely lost. How can we know the will of God or seek it, when we believe only in ourselves and keep our own will? It is for this reason that Abba Pimin used to say, The will is like a brass wall between man and God. Do you see the strength of that saying? In addition, he added, It is like a stumbling stone by which we go against and oppose the will of God. If a person relinquishes his will, he can truly say, By my God, I leapt over a wall. As for my God, his way is perfect. How wonderfully spoken! For when a person abandons his own will, he sees that the way of God is without blemish, but when he identifies himself with his own will, then he cannot see that the way of God is blameless. If he happens to be cautioned by someone, he immediately blames him, treats him with contempt, dislikes him and opposes him. How can he tolerate anybody or receive any advice whatsoever when he keeps his own will? 
Then the elder discusses justification. If justification is combined with the will, a person cannot follow the right path. What agreement there is in the words of a saint. It is death, particularly when justification and will are found together. This is a great danger and something greatly to be feared. The wretch falls down completely. Who can persuade him to believe that another person knows what is good for him better than he does? He is left to himself, left to follow his own thoughts, and the devil can make a corpse of him. This is why it says, an evil man does harm when he mixes with justice, and he It says that the devil hates the sound of security not only because he hates security itself, but also he cannot even bear to hear its voice. He even hates the mere mention of security. What I want to say is this, before someone who wants to ask about his spiritual gain does something, before the enemy learns whether he will be able to keep to what he has heard, He even hates the desire to ask and to hear something to his benefit. The devil hates this voice. He hates the very sound of these words and rejects them. I shall explain why. He is well aware that merely asking and exercising words about spiritual benefit will reveal his criminality. There is nothing he hates and fears so much as to be known because then he cannot do evil as he wishes. When the soul is protected by telling everything and advised by somebody who is spiritually wise, saying, do that, do not do that, or this is good, this is not good, this is justification, this is self-will, it is not the time to do this, or this is the time to do this, then the devil does not find an excuse to harm the soul or to cast it down. This is because, as I said, it is governed and protected from all sides, and the saying safety exists in much counsel becomes a reality. The evil one does not want this, but hates it. He wants to harm us, and rejoices even more over those who have no guidance. Why? Take the example of a brother who was loved by the enemy, and about whom the evil one says to Abba Macarius, I have a brother who when he sees me turns like the wind. The devil loves such men and always rejoices over those who are without guidance, and who do not commit themselves to somebody who, after God, can help them, and give them a hand. Did not the saint see the devil carrying all these tasty preparations to each brother in flasks? Did he not offend all of them? However, each one, being aware of his attempt, went away, confessed his own thoughts, and thus received help in the time of temptation. The devil, therefore, had no power over them. He found only that wretched brother trusting in himself, and having no guidance from anyone. Thus he made a plaything of him. He went away thanking him and cursing the others. Of course, when he told St. Macarius about it, and named the brother, the saint went to him and he found that this very thing was the cause of his destruction. He found him unwilling to confess. He found that he was not in the habit of disclosing his inner thoughts, Consequently, the enemy could do what he wished with him. When the saint asked him, How are things with you, my brother? He answered, With your blessing all is well. Again the saint asked, Do your thoughts not fight against you? He replied, In truth I am very well. He did not want to admit anything until the saint skillfully persuaded him to talk about himself. He then spoke the word of God to him, safeguarded him, and returned. The enemy came back to the brother desiring to cast him down. He acted shamefully, but he found the brother standing on his own two feet and no longer able to be fooled. 
So he left empty-handed and in shame. When the saint asked him, How is your friend, this brother? He did not call him friend, but enemy, and cursed him, saying, He also has abandoned me and is no longer influenced by me. He has become most wilder than all. This is why the enemy hates the sound of security, because he always seeks our destruction. He loves those who trust in themselves, because they are cooperate with the devil, and they themselves are responsible for their fall. I know of no other way in which a person can fall other than by trusting in his own heart. Some people say that a person falls for this or that reason. I, however, as I said, have never seen another kind of fall that is not caused by this. Have you seen somebody fall? Know that he trusted himself. There is nothing more serious than to trust yourself. Nothing is more pernicious. God has protected me and I am always afraid of this danger. When I was in the monastery, I used to confess everything to the elder, Abba John, and I never, as I have already said, did anything without consulting him. Sometimes my thoughts told me, this will be the elder's answer. Why do you want to bother him? I said to my thoughts, curse you, your discretion, your prudence, your wisdom, and your knowledge. Whatever you know comes from the devil. I would go to consult the elder. On some occasions, the elder replied in accordance with what I had thought, and my thought said to me, You see what happened? The elder answered you like I said, and you bothered him for no reason. I then used to say to my thoughts, Yes, by now this is good. This comes from the Holy Spirit, whilst what you said is evil, coming from the devil and from a state of passion. Thus, I never allowed myself to follow my own thoughts without guidance. Believe me, brethren, I was greatly comforted and free from anxiety, so much so that I was a little sad about this, as I said, since I used to hear that we must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. I perceived that I myself did not have this tribulation, and I was frightened and wondering, not knowing the cause of this comfort, until the elder explained to me, Do not be sorrowful, because everyone who puts himself under the obedience of the fathers has this comfort and freedom from cares. Brethren, take care to ask and not to trust in yourselves. Learn how much freedom from worldly cares, how much joy and comfort this brings. Since I said that, I am never sorrowful now. Listen to what happened to me. When I was still in the Cenobium, I once suffered great and unbearable sorrow, and I was in such pain and under such distress that I was almost ready to surrender my soul. This sorrow came from a devil. You know that such a trial only comes from the devil's malice. Normally the sorrow is very severe, but it does not stay very long. It is very hard, dark and without consolation, and one cannot find comfort from anywhere. Distress and suffocation come from all sides, but it does not take long for the grace of God to enter the soul, otherwise nobody would be able to endure this. I was under this temptation, as I said, and in sorrow. One day, when I was standing outside in the monastery courtyard, suffering and praying about this to God, Suddenly I looked into the church and saw someone going into the sanctuary who looked like a bishop, clothed in a rough sheepskin. I was not accustomed to approach somebody unknown to me, except in the case of need or if I had the blessing to do so. However, something drew me after him and I entered behind him. He stood for a long time, keeping his hands up towards heaven. In great fear I stood and prayed behind him. The vision of him made me afraid. When he finished his prayers, 
he turned and came towards me, and as he approached me, I felt my sorrow and cowardice retreating. Then, when he stood before me, he stretched out his hand, tapped my chest with his fingers, saying, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He also brought me out of a horrible pit, out of a miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my steps. He has put a new song in my mouth, Praise to our God. He repeated these verses three times, as I said, tapping my chest, and thus he went out of the sanctuary and left the church. Suddenly light, joy, consolation, and sweetness entered my heart, and I became a totally new man. I went out, running after him, wanting to find him, but not finding him. He had disappeared. From that time on, through the mercy of God, I have never been bothered by sorrow or cowardice, but the Lord has protected me. I said this, brethren, because I wanted to show you what great comfort and freedom from anxiety a person may have, with full safety, if he does not trust in himself, but casts everything concerning himself upon God and on those who, after God, can help him. Learn, therefore, brethren, to inquire and not to guide yourselves. This is good. This is humility, comfort, and joy. There is no other route to salvation than this. Why, then, should you vainly crush yourself? Perhaps somebody might ask himself what he must do if he does not have the right person to ask. If a person truly desires the will of God with all his heart, God will not abandon him, and certainly will guide him towards it. If a person directs his heart towards the will of God, God can illuminate a small child to reveal his will to him. However, if a person does not truly desire the will of God, even if he should go to a prophet, the Lord will reveal in the heart of a prophet an answer in accordance with a deception in his own heart. As it is written in the scripture, And if the prophet be induced to speak anything, I, the Lord, have induced that prophet. For this reason we should, with all our strength, guide ourselves towards God's will and not trust in our own heart. Even if there is a good thing to be done and we have a testimony of some saint that it is good, we must on the one hand hold that it is good, but on the other not trust in our own ability to perform it properly in the way it should be done. We must do all that we can, but at the same time ask advice as to how to do it. After we have done it, we should ask if we have done it well, and even when we act thus, we must not be carefree but awake the judgment of God. As that saintly man Abba Agathon said when he was asked, Are even you afraid, Father? He replied, I have done what I could but I do not know if my work pleased God. God's judgment is one thing, and man's another. May God shelter us from the danger of guiding ourselves, and make us worthy to follow the way